Castanasi. Uh, many of you will already know Alejandro because he was uh, a member of the the, uh, the UC Berkeley community for an extended period. He was a postdoc in Mary Powers' lab, a regular attendee of, of Herb Group and other MDZ-oriented uh, functions. Uh, and since that time, he's gone on to do uh, a couple of postdocs. His current postdoc is with Vance Riedenberg at San Francisco State University. Uh, and he has a faculty position, which he'll be at Southern Illinois University, which he'll be uh, kicking off in January. So congratulations on that. And uh, today he's going to tell us about his work on chytridiomycosis and the amphibian diversity crisis. Welcome back. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so it's great to be back in uh, Berkeley. I'm just uh, across the bay in San Francisco for a few months. Um, uh, I have to say, I actually um, I have, uh, I have some, uh, you know, those bad experiences that sometimes you have. I was assaulted, you know, almost robbed of very precious fill data here on Oxford Street uh, oh. the first time I, I arrived in Berkeley. Uh, but last week in San Francisco, I was attacked by bed bugs. Also, if you want to do Airbnb, think twice. Or there's some, uh, some risk associated with that. Anyway, so today I'm going to talk about Kitrumycosis in the Andes, where I actually spent the uh, past uh, five months. And what I'm going to talk about today is actually very fresh data. A lot of the actually actual data I, I entered over Thanksgiving uh, weekend. Um, so it's very fresh data, so it's, it's not a perfect, you know, it's, it's not a, a great talk um, <coughs> wise, but I'll, I'll, everything is unpublished basically that you're going to see today. So hopefully also I can get a lot of feedback from you just looking at, at uh, just very fresh looks at, at this data. So first I would like to acknowledge uh, many people uh, directly involved with um, the uh, experiments I'm going to talk, I'm going to be talking about, and most of the work that I'm going to talk about today is funded by NSF through a, um, a grant um, to uh, Mats Redenburg, who is a professor at um, SF State, who is here at the embassy, who got his PhD here. And also his lab has done a lot of the work of processing the, uh, um, the swabs for detecting um, kidney infection in, in the frogs. So uh, uh, synopsis of the talk, first um, I'm probably going to go uh, fairly quickly on these two points because I know that there have been previous talks on chytromycosis uh, in this semester here at the MVZ, so amphibian biodiversity crisis, something I think most people are familiar with, a very short primer of the biology of, of BD, but through, uh, well, the, fun the fungus that causes chytromycosis. And then the, uh, the, the, two, uh, the two main points of the talk is going to be tracking the epidemic of BD in the Andes, <coughs> testing a very specific hypothesis that was proposed in 2008 um, regarding how this disease has spread along the Andes, uh, the Andes mountain range, and um, then doing susceptibility trials in the field with species where BD has already arrived. And, uh, trying to understand which species are, are vulnerable, if they are, um, what are their differences among these species that are basically the surviving species once the outbreaks already occurred. And then some uh, research, some very preliminary research about potential miti mitigation strategies where BD is now endemic. So uh, this is a figure I, I like a lot from a paper in, in, in 2008 by uh, David Wade from Max and it's a figure where you see um, the uh, size of the countries modified to reflect the number of amphibian species they, they have. <coughs> and you see in this figure that South America is a big place for amphibians. And especially Andean countries are very big places for amphibians. Okay? So uh, the Andes are a place, with, it's, a, it's a hot spot for amphibian diversity. It's the most diverse places on Earth for amphibians are the eastern slopes of the Andes and the uh, Amazon Basin, uh, the foothill uh, of the Andes. So a very important place for amphibians, the Andes. <coughs> Actually, the 7,000 species of amphibian comes from the field site, uh, where, where it work is this glass front that does name Central Lane Sabini. Andrew Seven is a um, philanthropist who actually um, instituted a prize for amphibian conservation. So this is the 7,000 described species of amphibian that was described just uh, at the end of July this year. So that biodiversity crisis, I think most people are familiar with the fact that among vertebrates, amphibians are the most threatened groups. Uh, we have a, a big third of the species that are threatened. Many of those are critically endangered, meaning they're on the brink of extinction. 
And we also have a long list now of species that haven't been seen for 20, 30 years. <coughs> and people think they might, be, they might be extinct. And sometimes a few of them are rediscovered, which is great. And there are big news about that, but really when you compare how many are rediscovered to the long list and an increasingly long list of species that are gone missing for many years, um, it's, still, you know, it's still a big problem. Um, also, what is a worry is that many of those declines are enigmatic. It means they occur in places where the habitat is, is in very good shape, where the human, foot, human footprint is very low, um, and yet uh, those species disappear. And so there are, um, are, there are good examples in, in Central America, in Australia, um, in um, Atlantic Forest in Brazil, and also in, in Sierra Nevada, where we have uh, frogs um, going missing in national parks, for example. And so the same thing we'll see occurred in a national park where I work in the Andes. So there are many causes that people always discuss, and certainly the most per pervasive one, the <coughs> one that you find anywhere you go now, is habitat destruction, habitat modification, just because of or, uh, um, or greed and um, human needs. Um, so that's something that affects all areas in the world. And then we have um, some other causes that people have uh, proposed as drivers for those declines. And today we're going to focus, of course, in, on infectious diseases and most specifically on um, this fungus, <coughs> this uh, pathogenic fungus. This is just one of many examples of um, uh, fungal of mycosis of fungal pathogens that have been affecting. If you think about bats, white uh, nose syndrome. Um, if you think about southern oak uh, disease. If you think about um, also yellow rust. So many fungal diseases that have been affecting not just amphibians, but other <coughs> diseases that have been affecting other groups of animals and plants. But it's especially bad with amphibians, and, and now we know uh, we know that this is a, a serious serious issue. So it's caused by. Uh, by <coughs> Batraco kitchen uh, dendrobatidis. So here Batraco just means uh, amphibian. Kitchen uh, um, um, is uh, because it belongs to the group of uh, chytrids, so it's a primitive group in the phylogeny of, of fungi, and it's kind of, a, it's actually not uh, monophyletic. And dendrobatidis, because it was first described from um, a dendrobatis frog, uh, the Sony Museum, it was first described only in 1999, so the, the description is very recent. And it has these two uh, life stages. Uh, uh, this one is uh, sessile, the uh, zoosporangia. And the, the zoosporangia release this uh, mobile um, stage, which are the zoospores. And the zoospores are the ones that then um, can infect other ho hosts um, and they can swim in water. It uh, can be very, very virulent in some species. <coughs> it just kills um, all the individuals that it, it infects. But there's a great variation on, on the response of, of different species. And we know it grows best at uh, mid-temperature between 15 and 25 degrees, so it tends to be a problem in areas that tend to uh, stay relatively cool. So it's not a problem in lowland uh, tropical forests, for example, because they're uh, too warm. <coughs> so this life cycle, again, with the uh, sessile stages that infect the skin of amphibians and the uh, motile stage, the soil spore. So here are uh, these uh, sporangia. Here with a discharge of patella releasing the zoospores, then the zoospores can go on and infect um, other frogs that are in contact with those uh, zoospores. <coughs> so here, um, um, what it actually causes um, on the frog is that it um, um, interferes with um, electrolyte uh, balance, especially affecting the um, sodium potassium pumps and eventually it leads to the death by uh, interfering with uh, nervous transmission, for example, by uh, causing cardiac arrest in the frog. Um, here is um, a picture I took um, in 1999. It was actually the day of my birthday, I remember. And it's a mass die-off of uh, Atelopus harlequin toad frogs in, in, in the Andes. And we'll see why these harlequin toads are, are so important. One way to detect whether frogs are infected, and this, uh, this is the this slide from one of these, these two toads, is by doing a histology section, a skin section. And here, for example, you see again those, those soul sporangia filled with soul spores, so you can detect the, the infection. But this is a fairly invasive method, especially if the animal is alive. 
And so now the method that uh, most people use is um, quantitative PCR, where you just uh, swab <coughs> the animal, the skin of the animal, and then you can, um, uh, with the parameters of the fungus, you can uh, amplify the DNA of, of, the, uh, of the fungus, and also quantify the levels of infection. So now we have a technique where we can actually have an idea of whether the infection is a very low level of infection, just one zone score equivalent, this is proportional to the amount of DNA, or a very heavy infection in the animal that you swap. And we'll see why that's, that's very important actually to be able to quantify the level of infection. So it's a uh, worldwide <coughs> distribution. Um, so it's now been reported BD from um, all continents. But we are going to focus today, of course, in on South America. So two things can uh, occur when uh, BD arrives at a place. It can either cause this uh, mass die-offs. So this is an epidemic outbreak. And the first half of my talk is going to talk about whether we actually had one of these epidemics in the Andes. And the second response could be that just you have the disease becoming endemic. Okay, persistence of the disease, even though it doesn't cause those mass die-offs. And the second half is going to be uh, about um, um, what can we understand about the dynamic of BD once it, it becomes endemic. So first for the epidemic, and um, again, um, uh, working um, in the Andes, very important place, and we basically want to have an idea about uh, what occurred, whether we actually had an epidemic outbreak. And we had a uh, precedent for looking at this kind of question is the uh, epidemic um, outbreaks in Central America, uh, where people have hypothesized that there was actually a wave coming from uh, Costa Rica and going south into uh, Panama of these, um, these BD caused mass die-offs. And actually people, uh, for example, predicted fairly accurately when BD would arrive at El Copé, and they, and they went to the field site and they waited the arrival of BD, and, and they saw the effect with conscious frog sign. But the problem, of course, is that a lot of these occurred when <coughs> nobody was testing for the presence of BD. And so what we <coughs> did here at the MVZ is to, to go back and sample um, specimens that are deposited here at the MVZ to swap the, um, the, the preserved specimen and, and look for the presence of BD in those, in those specimens. So that's work uh, that um, Tina Chang did for uh, Master Thesis at uh, SF State. And, um, and here are the results are that actually when you look at the museum specimens and you look at which ones were positive and you look at the uh, dates of the earliest positive um, specimens, then it fits that, um, that wave of epidemic outbreaks. So the idea here is to do something very similar but for, for, for the Andes. Okay? So for the Andes, one problem is that the surveys, um, there, are, there are very few good surveys of amphibian communities. That's because most people focus on just documenting diversity and just collecting as much as they could, just to describe a lot of the new species. And so there aren't good population monitoring. Okay? There's a lot of surveys just to catch species, but there's not good population monitoring. So mm -hmm. that's a, a big restriction because to be able to see population declines, we need to be able to have this. What people have, and it's, it's kind of um, the only data set that is, is good for the entire Andean uh, mountain range, is data on these um, toads, harlequin toads. And the reason why people have re reasonably good data is because they're brightly colored, they're usually fairly pretty, like this one. And also they're diurnal. So even people who are not um, too much into frog, they'll, you know, they'll see these things and they'll remember whether these things were, were there or not. They're also fairly large, many species are fairly large. And so there is a spreadsheet, actually, um, that's the database for harlequin toads that basically lists um, which uh, one was the last year when these species were seen. And this database is just, um, people just ask um, different, um, different herpetologists, when is the last time you saw these species? Okay, that's the database. And so starting from this database, um, Karen Lips and collaborators in 2008 proposed this epidemic wave hypothesis for the Andes. And basically what they did is they plotted these um, years uh, when these harlequin toad species were last seen in the wild on a map of South America. And they realized that there were patterns, okay? 
and they hypothesized that basically BD entered the Andes through two introduction points, one in southern Ecuador in 1980, and another one in Venezuela in 1977. And then as you go south from Venezuela, and as you go north and south from Ecuador, you can see that the dates, they kind of follow a chronological order. Okay? And so they proposed this idea that BD got in here and here, and then it moved south through this epidemic wave, and it moved north through this epidemic wave, and south from this one. Okay, so three epidemic waves. Must be said that this paper had no data whatsoever on whether these animals were infected or not. It's just years when people think that this species went missing. Okay. That's it. There's not even data on actually how much of the population went missing or far from how many sites the Arlequin toads were missing. But that's just the last time every single species has been seen in these in these genes. How many species are there? Uh, from the database? Yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly. It's probably around 70 or 80 species. Oh. Yeah. All right, so while the idea is to basically test this hypothesis, okay, this is, at this point it's just a hypothesis. The idea is to test it, um, again, using museum specimens, going back to museum specimens collected in the 80s here and see where were they infected, were they not infected. So this is the work that uh, I did in part when I was at Gonzaga University lecturing uh, last summer, and also a lot of it has uh, been done at different universities. We have collaborators um, in South America working at different museums in Peru and Colombia. Uh, and we also got a lot of loans from different institutions here at the Fee Museum, University of Kansas, American Museum, and the Zikal Academy, well, many, many places from where we gathered roughly 5,000 specimens. And of course, we focused on Atelopus because that's the basis for the hypothesis. And so this is a genus that's uh, in a tropical distribution. We have so far about uh, 2,300 specimens that date from 1913 to 2009. But also we decided to add uh, frogs in another genus, Tomatobius. Uh, those are water <coughs> and frogs. Uh, the reason why we added these frogs is because Atelopus in the central Andes become very rare at high elevations. Uh, but we have a lot of Tomatobius species there. And we know that Tomatobius is also very susceptible to ED. It's, the genus actually is already gone from Ecuador, where there were three species, and now nobody's seen them for, for 15 years. Um, this is a distribution from Ecuador um, to Chile, okay? in, the, in, in, the, in the central tropical Indies. Here we have nearly 1,500 specimens, date from 1992 uh, uh, to 2012. Also another reason why we decided to add uh, Tomatobius is because they actually have a cultural importance in Andean countries. They are, for example, consumed by people. Uh, here is a stand at the market in Cusco, Southern Peru, where um, uh, you can buy these, these frogs. Um, they're usually consumed in, in soups. Okay. Here, for example, is to be consumed in soups, and some people also consume them in uh, frog shakes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, just uh, culturally is important, for example, in the Amara culture, uh, the, president, the president of Bolivia belongs to the Amara culture. Uh, the, uh, at the beginning of the world, what created the world was a huge frog, a tomatopus frog, actually. So, <coughs> culturally important and, what, and something that people, also local people, will tell you these, these, these frogs went missing. Um, actually, in some places, we were restocking the streams because they lost them didn't want to lose these frogs. So anyway, so we added also all these Tomatobius frogs. Um, and here I'm going to show you this, uh, again, published results showing <laughs> this test of the hypothesis for, for the Andean mountain range. So first, I'm going to show you the map <coughs> for all the decades prior to 1980. Okay. So we have 500 specimens for that. Um, the uh, circles are for Atelopus specimens, harlequin toads. And the squares are for Tomatobius, so this, the squares are only going to be along the uh, Ana Cordillera because it's a high elevation species. The circles can be at high elevations, especially in Ecuador, or they can also be in the lowlands. Okay. And here I'm just showing uh, the data for that southern wave south of Ecuador, okay, because we're still working on, on the other data. So prior to 1980, basically we have um, no positive. Okay? When it's an empty symbol, it means it's a negative. Um, so there is not positive um, 
uh, specimen that came up of either Atalopus or Tomatobius prior to 1980. Now, in the following decade, 1980 to 1989, is when we start, um, when BD starts showing up in these specimens. And the earliest um, um, specimens come from this area in, in central uh, Ecuador. And the earliest is 1984. Um, here are very large uh, series of Atalopus specimens. Um, people collected, there are a series of 100 animals from a site, probably collected in half a day. Now, it's, you ask anybody who works with the harlequin toads, it's impossible to find as many. But here, there are collections from the 80s where people will just go and collect hundreds of these things in, in a few hours. So we have all this uh, positive from uh, central Ecuador, and also we have um, another one here in southern Ecuador, and also in the late 80s, we, it starts show, showing up in, in northern Peru as well, okay? 87 to 89, it starts showing up there. All right, so this is the same map from, from the, for the 80s, and here we're gonna see the map for uh, the 90s. In the 90s, we see uh, that we have more positive samples from northern Peru. This is actually the picture of the mass die off of um, the Harlequin toads that I showed you previously. And also in central Peru, we have more positive showing up. Here, well, what happened is that people stopped collecting a lot of these things because people were not finding them anymore. And in the, uh, so this again is the data for the 90s, and in the, uh, over the last 12 years, we have the first uh, positive samples showing up starting around 2000 in southern Peru and, and Bolivia. And this is actually the last Tomatobius um, frogs that were ever found in Ecuador in the year 2000. And they were also positive. Okay. So it seems to fit this idea of this epidemic outbreak, uh, this wave moving south, at least for this, this part of the Andes, central Andes. So this is just an animation with the, <coughs> with the four figures you saw, the idea that there is a, um, there is this epidemic wave moving south from Ecuador. And at this point it seems to roughly fit this idea that we had an epidemic wave. <coughs> um, Despite the fact that really the initial hypothesis has no, had no support, um, had no data on infection levels for these things. Um, so still working on this data, um, still uh, fighting against um, ArcGIS. <laughs> Terrible problem to work with. Completely non-intuitive <laughs> program. Um, so, but this is basically we have overall, we have nearly 4,000 um, 4, specimens. A lot of uh, the specimens had to be filtered out for several reasons. Maybe they didn't have correct uh, uh, coordinates or year of collection and so on. But so the idea is to also investigate what happened here um, for the wave moving north and also what happened here with, with Venezuela. And we're also including data from published papers <coughs> already available uh, to everyone to, um, to make this data set as as complete as possible. But basically, the take home for now, um, this timeline of BD infection kind of fits this idea that the, there, was a, there was an epidemic outbreak, at least going south from Ecuador and into Peru. All right, another use, useful thing, um, and that really what kind of um, uh, pushed me to work, to do this kind of work, is that this hypothesis also allows for uh, testing predictions. And for example, if you look at this map, it kind of predicts that there will be declines here around the year 2000. And it happens that I worked in this area in southern Peru in um, between nine, uh, 1996 and 1999 when I was an undergraduate student. And the idea at that point was just to go there. It's a beautiful place. It's an elevational gradient. Um, in over 50 kilometers, you go from 4,000 meters to the lowlands, Amazon lowlands, 200, 200 meters. You can do this um, on a mountain bike. <laughs> good breaks, um, and uh, and so it was just a, a, a very nice place to just look at how species uh, turn over on this elevation gradient, and so that's the work I did in 1996 between 1996 and 1999, and the good thing is at that time I actually used standardized um, um, standardized method for sampling uh, female populations, and so I was able to replicate them just a few years ago when I went back to this area. So here we are in southern Peru. Uh, um, near the city of Cusco, so near the ruins of Machu Picchu, for example. And it's a, it's a very large national park, it's a minor national park, it's the size of the state of Massachusetts, so it's a gigantic national park. And it only has a road that borders the southern boundary of, of the park. 
uh, gigantic diversity. Um, so far, at least 130 uh, species of amphibians are uh, reported for the for this national park. The number grows, on average, three to four species every year. So. Uh, here I'm going to talk today mostly about species that are found in the cloud forest and um, the high Andean grasslands, high Andean grasslands, um, so it's bunch grass habitat, and this is all uh, cloud forest habitat. And this is just showing the elevation distribution of many of those species. Okay. So we're interested here, uh, species are found in, uh, all, all these are endemic species found in the um, bunch, bunch grass habitat and all these cloud forest species. So there's just uh, quickly some picture. This is the uh, Puna habitat with these sponge grasses, and these are a different picture of the cloud forest at these different elevations. Okay. And the habitat is, uh, you go now, it's just built, I mean, it's, you know, there's no human impact that you can, you can, you can see. So there's, there's, not, there's not been any change in the habitat itself. So the two standardized method were, one was doing leaf litter plots, um, uh, 10 by 10 meter leaf litter pots, just looking um, like uh, what people are doing here for frogs in bunch grasses or in the leaf litter. And so we did uh, over 400 of those leaf litter pots. And the second one was just going out at night and uh, standardizing by search efforts. So how many people were looking for the frogs and for how long. Okay. And so those two methods were done, in, especially in the wet season 1999, when I stayed there for three months. And we repeated again the, the wet season of 2008 and um, because in the wet season of 2008 so many species were missing, I decided to go back again in the wet season of 2009 to make sure it was not just because the wet season of 2008 was an especially bad wet season. Okay? So I went back actually to wet season to make sure that the pattern of missing species was, <coughs> was, a, was a real pattern. So m about 3,000 frog captures, and of course there was no swabbing for the frogs captured in 1999. But we did um, as well all the frogs capture in the uh, recent surveys uh, to detect for uh, uh, bit infection. So these are the results, and the results well are very sad. Um, um, for the leaf litter plots, there's not much difference. These are uh, species accumulation curves. So here on the x-axis, we have search effort. And here we have number of species. So this is looking at the effect on species richness. For leaf litter plots where you have a lot of the stress will bring uh, species that are usually not that affected by BD because they tend not to grow near water. Uh, there is a little bit of a difference, but it's not such a striking difference. Okay, There's a little bit of a loss of species. But really, if you look at the uh, nocturnal surveys where you pick up on all these stream breeding species, you see that it's like comparing a tropical to a temperate site, really. Okay? In 99, you had nearly 35 species detected by this method, and now you have half the species you see the, the confidence interval, they don't even ever overlap. So those are, it's like different communities, but it's exactly the same place. These are some species that are gone missing. Um, there were two harlequin toads that are both missing. This is one of them. Uh, half the uh, number of glass frogs are gone missing. Some are super frog that also uh, went missing. And this is uh, a uh, trestle breeding frog. That's the only trestle breeding frog that um, has gone missing. And actually, I actually found it at lower elevations. And here are species that are still around. These are toad, stream breeding toad, one of the few that are still around. This is a glass frog that's still around. The 7,000 species actually is also a survivor, it's still around. Uh, this is a super frog that we'll see is that actually not susceptible to BD. And this is a trestle breeding frog that's, that's also still around. So in general, what's gone missing is a lot of the stream breeding species. Also, personally affected by this loss <laughs> is the loss of uh, this uh, little frog that's named me by a friend, and I haven't been able to see it um, since uh, 1999. Uh, this is some uh, field data that uh, kind of um, are out there to support the link that BD is driving these declines. Here on the x-axis we have prevalence of BD in different arbitrarily defined communities. Communities defined as anything that occurs in a 100 meter elevation range. So each point here is, let's say this is probably the point between 1400 and 1500 meters. Okay. So for that point, between 400 and 1,500 meters in 2008, we had a prevalence of 40%, which is very high, and half the species are missing. Right. So if you plot your elevational gradient this way, that's what you find. You find <coughs> something that's indicative. Uh, it's actually a significant uh, positive uh, correlation between prevalence of BD and 
what proportion of the community is missing from, um, the, uh, from what you can see now, what you can find now. So what we have again is over just 10 years, this happened over just 10 years between my undergraduate and graduate okay, years. Uh, so it's, it's very fast, right? It's very fast, just 10 years and it happens exactly uh, around 2000, which is that prediction of this epidemic wave should arrive there by 2000. So you went there before, you find all the frogs. After, well, half the species are missing. Also, disease prevalence is a strong predictor of what's the proportion of the community that, that you're missing. Um, so the next question is, though, are, are the actual species vulnerable to pterygomycosis? And this is the work that was just uh, done over the past five months. And this is also important to understand because, of course, we cannot test what is the effect on the missing species because they're missing. But we have survivor species. We have now a BD that's endemic in this area and sometimes a very high uh, prevalence. And so we need to understand which species are now most at risk from maybe a lower decline but still um, a conservation, uh, an important conservation question. So we did that by um, experimentally infecting frogs in what you're going to see is a makeshift lab setting, it's a, a field lab, um, and then we compare survivorship between infected and treated frogs. And it turns out our treatment also did not work 100% uh, the way we intended, but um, I think the results are still uh, quite interesting. We did that with nine species in four different families. We had up to 200 frogs, um, and it lasted from between three and six weeks. These, these trials. Uh, we did that at this uh, <coughs> biological station, Waikicha Biological Station, which is managed by the Amazon Conservation Association. This is advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the uh, science director of the station right now, so advertisement. Um, so Amazon Conservation Association has a hot water and internet here at the cabins. <laughs> Spectacular views. It's actually um, one of the few places uh, along the Andean Cordillera where you can see uh, the sunrise over the Amazon. So instead of having a blue ocean, you have a green ocean, which is what you see right here. And then you see uh, you know, the red ball coming out of that. And so it's, the elevation? It's, it's pretty, that's uh, 3,800 meters. So you can only see that in, in, in July when it's, um, this is freezing temperatures. <laughs> but very, very beautiful, very, very beautiful. Um, we also did a workshop for our Peruvian students, um, introducing them to disease ecology, many of the te techniques. Actually, they looked for a lot of the animals. They, also, they searched for a lot of the animals that were used um, were used to, during this experiment. The only uh, little problem was the absence of a lab, and they kind of made a lab that kind of worked. Um, but now, as part of uh, being a science director, I really pushed for building a lab. So they're actually going to turn the actual dining hall, which is super nice view into labs, so that's mm -hmm. gonna happen next year. There is a Pachamanca where uh, food is cooked um, under the ground, so potatoes and so on. Here's um, Andres Way and Jeff um, eating food. So this is the place where we did these experiments. So of course the problem is that um, um, you need BD to be able to infect the frogs. And we were able to isolate BD, but it didn't grow until the very end of the field season. Okay, so we, we actually have the BD strain from there growing now, but we didn't have it available when we wanted to do the susceptibility trials. So we had to work around this, this limitation. The way we wor worked around this limitation is that we used live frogs um, to, infect, um, to infect our species. And we used these Stomatobius marmoratus frogs from um, City Market in Cusco. Um, I'm going to explain why we did that, and then those are the eight species that we used. Um, we used that are from this um, Manu National Park. Okay. So we have two more super frogs that we used. We have tree frog, a stream tree frog, a terrestrial breeding frog that lives in the grasslands, and four cloud forest terrestrial breeding species. Okay, so uh, the reason why we use this. Um, the Stomatobis frogs is because we did a survey at its market in Cusco for two years, and over those two years we found 100% prevalence of BD in these frogs that were being sold alive. So we, we, we assumed that everything we bought from this market was infected. So this is our provider, <laughs> all the uh, Stomatobis ladies. So it's a funny story, the first time I went to buy them, um, 
first she didn't want to say uh, sell 20 because that's a lot of frogs. Um, and then she asked who they were for. And I said for myself. <laughs> and she was very puzzled by this answer. Um, and then she went on to explain me the use of the live frogs. And basically you use li live frogs if you have um, if you cannot become pregnant, and <laughs> you rub the frog in different parts of your body, <laughs> and that's why people buy them. So, a random guy getting there buying 20 frogs for <laughs> <laughs> personal use. That's anyway. Uh, <coughs> so those frogs, um, the way um, we then. Uh, and there's a little bit of a difference of what is a control and an effective frog for this Tomatobius and every, everybody else. So for this Tomatobius, a control is a group of five frogs that were treated with an antimycotic drug, itraconazole, during seven days. That's the control. And the infected are the ones that were never treated. And we actually use those infected ones to expose your frogs. Okay. So these are frogs um, that are placed in an itraconazole bath. So the other group then is the eight species, and those they all came from night surveys that we did in the area. And then usually we, uh, we had a minimum of eight frogs, so we could have four control and four infected. For some species, we had more, uh, more frogs. We also tried to get a, a frog from um, different elevations. So actually those are the elevation range, <coughs> ranges of the eight species. So you see that they cover a, quite a reasonable um, elevation range. And then all the frogs uh, underwent the uh, treatment, the itraconazole treatment, so supposedly all cleared from infection. And then again, we had between four and five as a control, not exposed to any of the tomatobius frogs, and between four and 20 uh, exposed to those tomatobius frogs. So this is the exposure. Um, basically, we had tap, uh, tapper, tupperware, um, and on one side, we had a tomatobius frog. And on the other side, we had a frog, and then a thin layer of water for the salt spores to be able to move uh, throughout the, um, the top of the world. And infection exposure was during five days. Okay. So there is um, something, uh, there are, well, there are many questions that we try to address with these experiments. One, of course, I already <coughs> mentioned is uh, which species are actually at risk. Another thing that uh, people have been finding over the past um, two years, really, is that there is kind of a, a rule of what makes a frog sick, um, and it's called the uh, Vredeborg's uh, 10,000 zoospore rule. Okay. And so in, 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 many, uh, in, in many cases where people have done this kind of work uh, previously, like here with uh, crawf uh, crawfish uh, frog, uh, it's usually around 10,000 zoospores. Okay. This is a paper from, from last year, 2011. Um, uh, kind of the first data supporting this idea come from uh, Vance's work from uh, Brana Muscosa in, 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 in the Sierra Nevada. And here it, um, the day where you have population collapses is the day when a lot of those individuals again hit these 10,000 old sport. Okay. Here is other data from um, Tina's paper <coughs> looking at um, um, uh, tropical species. Actually, this is a frog, and these are two uh, uh, platodontic salamanders. And it seems, again, you know, for these two salamanders, as soon as they hit 10,000 old spores, they die. And this, if you think about it, I mean, it's something very, uh, very important information because then that means you can go back to your field data, look at your uh, QPCR results, and anything that has above 10,000 old spores in the field, it's likely to, to probably die, you know, those individuals that have over 10,000 old spores. So that's another question that we tried, that we wanted to address with this, these experiments. So I'm gonna go uh, speeches by speeches fairly quickly. Uh, there's gonna be some disturbing videos. It shows um, the infected animals and how they respond. So this, um, the first one is Tomatobis marmoratus. What you can already see, which is some of the symptoms of um, having infected animals is that they shed a lot of skin. You just see a lot of the skin here. Um, and also this tetanic spasm. So that's mostly what these videos are, are gonna show is this uh, tetanic spasm that um, caused by the mycosis. And all these videos were taken about two hours before these, these animals died. So their muscles kind of get lock, locked mm -hmm. in, in, in these tight positions. So that's been seen in many species now um, as being indicative of um, animals suffering from mycosis. Mm -hmm. 
So it turns out these animals were dying so quickly that we had to set up four different trials because, again, we were using them for exposure, so we needed the animals to be alive, but they were dying so quickly that we actually set up four different trials. This is just the uh, results from the first trial. And you know, for each species, we're going to have the survivor survivorship curves here on top. Um, in black, the uh, animals that were treated, and white, the infected animals. And below, we're going to have the uh, um, infection loads for infected animals and for treated animals. So for uh, this species, very significant difference in the survivorship curve. Well, you see a very sharp decline, well, that de death of the infected animals. But the uh, best models predict an average survivorship of just nine days for these, for these animals coming from the market. Um, and you see this is the average uh, maximum zoospore load, um, lo the log number of that. So 10,000 should be four. And you see for the ones that die infected is three. Usually it's between three and four for animals that are infected and that, um, that have a great percentage of, of them dying. And for the control we have, we have just between um, 10 and zoospore, 10 and 100 zoospore uh, loads on average and a uh, higher survivorship. So we're basically going to go through the same um, graphs for each one of the species. So clearly these are highly susceptible species, and we know that this genus in general is highly susceptible to, to BD. Here is one of the two uh, marsupial uh, frogs, and this is not really a species that has declined in the wild, but nevertheless, the, um, these, these trials um, do show that the species is actually highly susceptible. So the infected frogs here also dying. Uh, much faster rate than the controls, actually none of the controls died. And we have again support for this 10,000 zoospore load. Okay? We have an average maximum zoospore load of 4 and over 80% of the animals dying for the infected ones. The other marsupial frog, um, no effect, okay? no effect on infection. Uh, so both the infected and controls uh, survived. And we also have no, different, no significant difference in the uh, zoospore load, mm -hmm. so never developed. Um, also another thing that you see usually when um, you can see the effect of BD is this kind of exponential rise in infection load, okay? mm -hmm. leading to this four, to this 10,000 zoospore and eventually death. So we have nothing of that here um, for this um, gastrotech exhibitor. Also we don't have that for the terrestrial uh, breeding frog that lives in the, uh, in the uh, bunch grass habitat. Um, this is actually the one that had the longest, um, the longest trial, and we had no difference. No one died. Also, no pattern in the infection loads. Okay. <clears throat> now we move to um, the kind of the only cloud forest survivor that is a tree frog that breeds in streams. Okay, that's the only one that survived this this outbreak of BD. Uh, Hypsiboros gladiator. So it's still uh, it has gone missing from parts of its elevational range. Uh, but it's still relatively abundant in a small part of its original elevational range. So this is actually kind of very disturbing to watch. But it's the same kind of spots. Um, and, and this individual actually um, got very sick. Um, it, it took three days for this frog to actually to actually die. The second day kind of recovered, and this is the third day, and then eventually it died. So some of these populations are uh, apparently, it seems like they're resistant to BD, some of them. Um, the susceptibility trial does shows that there is an effect of, of BD. Um, so again, the infected one dying uh, faster. Okay. Our average lifespan of 30 days for this experiment, over the 33 days that it lasted. This is actually the individual that you saw in the video. Again, an individual that reached 10,000 old spores and then, and then died. We think that actually these species might function perhaps as a reservoir for BD. And the area where these species is found uh, half the, the other species and all the stream breeding, all the other stream breeding species are missing. Okay. So it's kind of the only survivor in those streams. Okay, now for the uh, fourth Pristimantis species. Pristimantis is a very uh, rich uh, species, rich genus in the Andes. Uh, it's kind of dominant um, amphibian found in the, in the eastern slopes is these uh, Pristimantis frogs. Uh, they haven't really um, um, declined in the sense they're still fine throughout the relational range here, but numerically they also have declined. They're not as abundant as they used to be. Here for the most common species, we see an effect in the survivorship curve, even though not significant difference in the uh, zoospore load. 
maybe here some of these deaths uh, are not related uh, strictly to to BD. Um, here is another very common species, uh, Prismantis denai. Um, here we have no significant effect on the survivorship. This one actually, a lot of them just died um, over a few days. Again, perhaps it's not not all of them died because of BD, even though there are at least a few individuals that reached again this 10,000 soil spore uh, infection load. Um, this again a video for one of them, Pristimatis um, tough, tough thing. This one, um, it didn't take as long to die. You usually will just wake up in the morning and they will be dead. Um, as opposed to the Tomotobis, for example, will take several hours. So in this species, there is a, a very strong effect of, of uh, bit infection. You can see the uh, infected ones have much shorter lifespan than the, uh, than the control ones. And again, we have an average near that 10,000 source per world. And the last Pristimantis species is a species that actually used to be very common along streams, and now it's impossible to see them along streams. You can still find the species, but only in the forest. <coughs> you can no longer find them along streams. Um, here, uh, it's not a significant result, even though I think that there is actually um, an effect of BD, and you can see that effect here with this, again, exponential rise in infection load, and again, an average around four. So clearly indication that a lot of these individuals were dying because, because of BD. <coughs> so I think uh, it's, well, from a conservation standpoint, uh, this was not a perfect experiment. We had tons of limitation space. <coughs> we had, even feeding the animals was a hassle. Keeping them warm enough was difficult. Was, again, it basically was out in, in the field. Uh, but I think it already clearly gives um, clear data on which species are most susceptible, which one we should not spend any time on because they're clearly not, not affected by BD. Also, it gives a lot of support for this 10,000 zoospore rule, and that's very important. It means it can be a very general rule that applies to a lot of things in temperate and tropical location. Uh, we know which one of the uh, uh, species that are uh, prioritary for <coughs> conservation. And uh, the last talk is probably going to take just two minutes. Uh, some possible <coughs> mitigation strategies that we started. Um, well, one is just uh, um, to at least avoid spreading the disease, is just to uh, bleach everything. And that's usually easy to <laughs> tell and prove because the most common brand of, of, of bleach is called uh, Sapolio, and Sapo is toad in, in, in Spanish. So then it's easy to. <laughs> Tell people, oh, use Sapolio, so you protect Sapos. Right? <coughs> um, so one, that's one way of preventing the spread. Well, of course, in this case, we already have BD, and so some ideas um, borrowed from what people are doing here in Sierra Nevada, for example, is they're using bacterial symbionts that grow on the skin of amphibians. And so we did some of this work where we basically uh, cultured um, um, bacteria from swabs taken on frogs. And then we just isolate uh, different bacterial strains, and then we test which one of the bacterial strains uh, inhibit the growth of the fungus. And one of the bacterial strains that people have found here in temperate areas is uh, this bacteria, Gentium bacterial libidum. It's been tested in the lab. It's been shown to be successful. And I'm not going to go into detail, but it's it's um, it's a gram-negative bacteria that produces this uh, purple solution. So it's very easy to identify whether you have it culturing or not. And this um, bacteria produces a toxin that that protects uh, frogs from BD, and this is uh, part of the work that uh, Vance did in, in Sierra Nevada a couple of summers ago, where he exposed a lot of um, the frogs of a surviving population of uh, Brown Sierra to this chance of bacterial libidum with some interesting uh, results. So we also tried to do the same kind of uh, approach of trying to culture bacteria. Again, uh, at first, actually, a lot of the bacteria won't grow because it was too cold. And this is uh, Vicky Fletcher. Um, she actually flew from Colombia to help us uh, with this effort. And eventually, she took all the, all the plates to her room. So she slept with the bacteria. <laughs> and here is the first day. Uh, I like this picture. She's very happy. It's the first day that she actually had any growth on this bacteria. And so then, then we actually isolated over 200 strains of those bacteria. So like 255 strains from 132 frogs. And so she's actually the, now, Vicky, she's doing, uh, she's in Bogota, University of Los Andes, and she's doing all these um, uh, inhibitory uh, trials where basically she, um, she has really growing on a plate and there's a negative control, and then there's a strain being tested, and then she quantifies um, 
the, the inhibitory activity of those strains. And so she has already tested uh, 40 of those strains, and she found nine that, that uh, inhibit the growth of the fungus. These are two examples. This is a strain from this uh, strain tree frog that is still around. Um, and this is supposed, at, at, at first, the plate is entirely white, covered with BD. So you see that now there is just a little bit of white just here near the negative control, but it's gone from this bacterial strain. And same here for this um, marsupial frog that is not affected by BD. So, well, this is still working going on, but hopefully um, the opportunity here to find a good, a good bacterial strain that has great inhibitory capacity that's easy to culture and that then can be used to expose other frogs, to inoculate other frogs with this bacteria and maybe provide some protection, um, some um, immune defense against, against BD infection. All right, so just conclusions um, from the uh, first half of the talk, just looking at the historic timeline of infection. It does provide support for this um, annual wave hypothesis. Um, we also know from these susceptibility <coughs> trials that species that survive these epidemic outbreaks are actually still susceptible to BD, so over the longer term they could still suffer population declines, even though at this point is, uh, is, is endemic, it's a different dynamic for BD. Uh, there's also support for this um, um, Bredenburg's 10,000 rule of, um, of infection leading to death in, in animals. And some hopes here with, with the bacterial symbionts. And I'm all out of time, so um, I'll be glad to take any questions. So I think some people will probably have to go, so we'll give you a moment to run out if you have uh, somewhere to be at 1 o'clock, and afterwards we'll let Alison go answer questions. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Alessandro, there's a widespread uh, feeling that glass frogs are, are not as susceptible as other frogs. And I noticed that you did have glass frogs susceptibility in your sample. Yes, uh, so the question is why I didn't have them? No, do you, do you think that central units are more susceptible in general? Oh. Or, or less susceptible in general? Uh, I don't know, it would have been great to have uh, those species in the trials. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, July, between July and August is, is, is the, uh, the driest, mm -hmm. the dry yeah. season, so, right. so they're very hard to find. Um, I, when I just left two weeks ago, uh, there were there were just tons of glass rods, so it would have been possible to do it. They, they seem to be surviving pretty well. Uh, um, two species, well, there were five species, of which two are gone. One was very common and it's gone. Of the three surviving, one is Central Inis Sabini, um, and it, it's always been rare. Another one, its elevation of range shrunk dramatically, so it's now super rare. And the third one has always been common and it's still common. Um, can you explain where the lady got her frogs and, and um, <laughs> why? Where did she get them? How did they? How come they were all infected? And why didn't they just? Why don't they all die before she sells them? Yeah, so we don't know where they get from, but probably uh, um, from people who uh, they're all wild caught. Because, all wild caught. Yeah, nobody nobody grows these, these frogs. I mean, they're, it's pretty you know, it's pretty difficult to feed them, for example. Um, so they're all wild caught. They're probably caught by children, I would think. For the most part, I mean, three frogs sell for like a dollar, a dollar fifty. So it's probably caught, you know, it's probably children who catch them. Um, so it's probably very difficult to trace them back to a specific location. Um, why? So basically, what happens is when the frogs die, she skins them and then she sells them um, either fresh or dried. We also send them dry. So it doesn't really affect her business because she, you know, if a frog is dead, she would just skin the skin the frog and just sell it. As so why haven't they gone locally extinct? Yeah. Well, it has actually gone locally extinct from many places. So there are still places where you have populations and enough, you know, populations large enough that they can get enough frogs for that. But in many places in the Andes, they have gone locally <coughs> extinct. And I've been to places where people will come and will, and it almost hit me because I was going after the frogs and they were telling me, well, they, you know, five years ago they all went missing and we went, like, we hacked two days to get eggs from this other place and bring them back. There are a lot of places where they are going to see them. She'll missing. probably go out of business in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of intriguing that, um, uh, you know, they're still selling the frogs. Um, 
Can I ask a related question? Yes. I mean, do these things have a sufficient elevational range that there might be populations that are below some sort of evolution uh, elevational threshold where BD is not not hitting them or not knocking out populations, and then just bringing them up to this place where they all become infected before she sells them? Yeah, um, yes. Historically, they had uh, fairly wide elevational ranges, probably going from 2,500 to 5,500 meters. Um, so it's pretty wide elevational range. The, the, the intriguing thing is actually when missing from the lowest um, bound of the elevation range in many cases. So it's kind of strange that when missing from places where you would think that maybe because it's, it gets warmer, they can get shielded from, from BD. On the other hand, at very high elevations, they probably cool technically bask very quickly you know, and raise their temperature very quickly. But who knows what gives them protection? And the BD had to get there to the high elevations. I mean, that's the thing. How are they getting? Are they getting to those high elevations from people, or is it in the environment already? Or I mean, how is it getting to those places? Yeah. So there's another study where they actually tracked a population of thematobius that uh, colonized ponds that were just deglaciated over the past 20 years, and that's the highest uh, amphibian population recorded anywhere anywhere on, on Earth, and that is a population of 5,500 meters that was colonized by these thematobius. Um, and so they were able to document the fact that they colonized, and then BD arrived there, and every, everything died. Uh, and so now there's no longer a population. Mm -hmm. so, do, do you know what the thermal tolerances of BD are? There is. Well, I mean, could, can it sustain freezing? <coughs> we, I don't think we know, but we know that it does Be well at low temperature. What limits so those growth? Some of those Tomatobias can super cool. You can put them in a block of ice yeah. and thaw them out, then they move. So, I mean, if that, if that takes care of the BD, that's the way to, to sterilize the animals rather than your, uh, at least those high elevation ones. But you've got BD at 11,000 feet in the Sierra Nevada. Yeah, so uh, I would think low temperatures there. are not a problem. Yeah. It's warm temperatures okay. that are a problem for BD. And usually, and some people have actually developed treatments, especially for tadpoles, just expose them at, at warm temperature. And then uh, they were able to get rid of PD. That's also how they get rid of the bad bugs. <laughs> As I recall, Vance's work on this bacterium that he's been experimenting with has the potential problem that it's endemic in these lakes already. And if it's endemic, how are you going to increase the level of it so that it has any effect on the frogs? Is, it, is this is this concern also relevant to your work in, in, uh, in, uh, in, yeah, in the Andes? Yeah, I think, I mean, for the Sierra, is, uh, the system is so much better understood. Uh, some, you know, the, the work that's been done there is, 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 is so complete. You know, the people developing models, people having uh, such detailed field data, that, you know, like what Vance collected and, and, and Tate and other people. Like very detailed field data on, on what happened, which ponds um, had an outbreak, when they had an outbreak. There's nothing near that for yeah, this yeah. study site. So it's, it's but her source of bacteria is obvious from the same water, it's the same area that the fungus occurs in. Right. For the bacteria? Yeah. Yes, for the bacteria. So uh, one interesting thing is actually that this gentilobacterium lividum uh, has never been reported for tropical areas. But preliminary work that um, that we did in, in, in the lab actually shows that it's present at high elevations in Peru. It's just very rare. Um, so it's not something that we want to focus on. We just want to kind of discover strains that are very abundant in frogs there that are easy to culture that we can, we can use there. I think that's probably, that's probably a better way to do it, especially if they're very easy to culture. Yeah, I guess it's a slightly more technical question, but it seemed from your experiment that some of your control frogs were infected. Is that right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah thank you. And so there, yeah. it seems that there are two possibilities there. Either it's carryover from their own their own infection, you know, prior, before and after the intraconazole treatment, or it's a new infection that they got from the intraconazole-treated Telmatobius frogs. And it seems like that distinction might be kind of important because there could also be a strain effect going on if the Telmatobias were infected with a virulent <coughs> strain and those frogs that you were using in the experiment were infected with less virulent strain. One of the things that I think is, is coming out of more research conducted here and elsewhere is that there, there aren't really dramatic differences in virulence between strains, and potentially even on a re reasonably small spatial scale. Yeah, yeah, so I, I forgot to mention that, so 
That's that's a great question. Uh, so yeah, ideally, um, ideally, what we wanted to have is either um, either frogs were infected or they were completely clear of infection. But the intracranial treatment did not work the way it was intended. So we were not able to clear them of infection uh, completely. So what we have is basically a low-level infection or a um, you know a boost in the in the infection level. Um, and that in part is probably because of the drugs we, we bought. Um, uh, usually people do that with liquid etriconazole, but we didn't have that and we actually uh, just bought uh, the pills that are used for humans in, in Peru, which you can, in Peru you can just buy without prescription. Um, and we're just crushing the pills and dissolving it in water, but apparently it's, 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 not, it's not such a great way of, of treating them because it didn't clear the infection. It, there is still there is still your question. Yes, there is still your question, and that is something we don't know. Um, uh, we do have we do have the DNA of, of the strains that we're able to isolate. So it's something that hopefully we'll be able to answer soon when we, we commit the sequence those different. If there are different strains, um, then that will provide a, an answer to your question. Yes. I'm compelled to ask this question. Of course, I understand the concentration on frogs. You can get decent sample sizes. But in Manu, at mid-range, there are six or seven species of Sicilians, uh -huh. including two that have free-living aquatic larvae, and the others are completely terrestrial and all that. So I'm, of course, curious whether you're at least swabbing everything that comes in. Yeah, so um, uh, Sicilians there are um, just a... Uh, as often is the case, a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> one year, I, I know that one year in, in 97, um, they redid the road with like bulldozer. Mm -hmm. and, and so people were finding tons of Sicilians mm -hmm. because they were digging holes. And But um, except for that, I mean, it's, it's hard to find them. Um, and they're actually, this is kind of above, there is a species that you can still find up to 1,700 meters. Most of the other ones are actually below the kind of cutoff elevation that, that is used for this study. Mm -hmm. So most of the species are found in the mountain forest, like 1,200 mm -hmm. and lower elevations. And, and for those, I mean, I didn't, I didn't focus and a lot on my There doesn't seem to be a chytrid problem at those lower elevations, you don't? Well, I don't know, because, um, because I didn't sample, I didn't swap yeah. frogs at no. those, those elevations. Mm -hmm. um, just now, this five, Past months, I, I, I started doing that because I actually bought a car, so I was able to go down. <laughs> um, a car that broke down many times. Um, um, and so now we are going to have data um, that are being, are being processed right now to see basically, because right now what we have, we know we have a peak in prevalence at 1,500 meters. We know it goes down like in a bell-shaped curve yeah. as you go up in elevation, but we don't know the other side. Right. We don't know how it goes down. We know in the lowlands it's rare. But we don't know what happens between 1,500 and 600 meters, which is also. Uh, You've got your harlequin frog there. Yes. <coughs> the harlequin toad. Yeah, yeah. There were those two species were between 1,200 and 2,000 meters, but yet now they're they're missing. Let's take a second.